Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Lawrence Douglas. I teach in the Department of uh, Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought here at Amherst. And I'd like to welcome you to the um, second event in the semester's uh, Point Counterpoint series. Uh, this uh, series has been organized by uh, Professor Nishi Shah, uh, Professor Alexander George, and myself. And uh, the uh, series is designed as a kind of pedagogic complement to the first year seminar cluster course called uh, Progress, or I should say Progress, to emphasize the question mark at the end. And it's been made uh, possible uh, by a gift from the members of the 50th reunion class of 1970. I'd also like to thank um, those who helped put, put together this event, including the Office of Communications, Conferences, and Special Events, and the President's Office. Uh, the Point Counterpoint series is designed to bring prominent speakers to our campus and to engage them in a uh, thoughtful conversation about important issues of the day. Uh, the idea is not to score points in a debate, uh, but to model uh, considered critical inquiry about contested matters that resist simple solution. Uh, our first event, as you recall, um, featured a conversation with uh, professors Anthea Appia and uh, Adolf Reed about issues of identity and race. And uh, today's uh, conversation is devoted to the issue of free speech, um, its purposes, its vexations, um, the challenges it faces from the right and from the left. And we are extremely fortunate to have uh, Professor Jeffrey Stone here to help us discuss these, um, these fraught issues. Uh, Stone comes to us as perhaps the nation's preeminent scholar on the First Amendment and free speech issues. Uh, Stone was raised in Bronx, Queens, and right neck, <laughs> and took his degree um, took his degrees at Penn's uh, Wharton School and the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, after clerking for William Brennan on the US Supreme Court, Stone joined the faculty of the University of Chicago Law School, where he has served as dean of the school and also as provost of the university. And he's presently the university's Edward H. Levy Distinguished uh, Professor. Uh, he's the author of many books, only one of which I will play a uh, show and tell. <laughs> um, this is Perilous Times, uh, Free Speech in Wartime. Um, my brother and I um, have a kind of informal uh, reading group together, and we have a certain designation for books, and this one was designated uh, PFTB, uh, which is our term for a pretty frickin' terrific book. And um, <laughs> uh, Perilous Times has won uh, numerous uh, national book awards, including the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and I urge all of you to read it. Really an outstanding work. Uh, Stone has written uh, amicus briefs in numerous cases, including for uh, Lawrence v. Texas, which some of you might know was argued before the Supreme Court by Amherst College uh, trustee Paul Smith. Uh, he also wrote in uh, Obergefell v. Hodges, uh, Rasul v. Bush. Uh, he represented Bill Clinton before the US Supreme Court in the Clinton v. Jones case. Uh, and was appointed uh, President Obama to serve on the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technology. And last, but uh, perhaps not least, uh, he is the proud father of Molly Stone, Amherst College, class of 2001. Uh, so we're going to have a, a conversation, which will probably last about um, 45 to 50 minutes or so, and then we're going to open things up for questions from you. And uh, because this event is being recorded, uh, we're going to ask you to ask your questions into a microphone. There'll be a microphone available over here. And then you could also, I mean, if it's hard for you to get access to that, we can also hand you this handheld microphone from here. So without any further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming um, Jeffrey Stone to Amherst College. Jeffrey, um, I wonder if uh, you could actually begin by maybe uh, with a somewhat um, maybe unusual question, which is I think there are a number of uh, first-year students actually in, in attendance here. 
And I was wondering if you could maybe um, tell us something about your first semester in college, whether at that time it was clear that you wanted to be a legal academic and a foremost ex uh, expert on uh, First Amendment issues. So um, when I uh, entered college uh, in 1964, um, the world was very different. We didn't know anything about colleges. We had guidance counselors in high school who would give us advice about where we might fit in. We never visited the schools. There was nothing online. There was no online. Um, I knew next to nothing about anything, about college or about Penn. Um, and I got there in the fall of my freshman year and had an interesting experience and enjoyed it. The most noteworthy part of my first year experience happened actually at the end of the spring quarter, spring semester, I should say. Chicago is a quarter system, sorry. And is not at the end of my spring semester, there was an anti-Vietnam War uh, protest, and I um, participated in it. And uh, as we were uh, marching along uh, a sidewalk next to some building at the university, a group of students, not including myself, um, climbed up onto this metal um, fence. And the fence had bars going vertically, and then one horizontally, and then uh, things on the top with spikes on them. And they climbed up on it. I don't think it was anything about the particular building they were doing it for. It was just part of the protest. And the top part broke off and fell over. And one of the spikes hit me in the back. And I was bleeding pretty badly. And students around me got all upset and, and they held the car. And the driver of the car was nice enough to let me go into the back seat with two, a couple of the other students helping me. Um, I probably got blood on their back seat. I don't know. They took me to the university hospital. Um, I went in there for, I don't know, four or five hours, and they sewed me up, and then they sent me back to my uh, dorm room. And at about 8 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call. And the call was from, these were in the days when there's no cell phones, it was a real telephone. Um, and the call was from the dean of students' office. And the person said, um, is this Jeffrey Stone? And I said, yes. And they said, come to the dean of students' office at 10 o'clock. And I said, why? And they said, just be here. So I had to find out where the hell the dean of students' office was. I had no idea. Um, and I went there, and it turned out the dean of students and a committee of faculty members uh, said, you were involved in an anti-war protest yesterday. And I said, yes. And they said, and you were injured during that protest because you were climbing up on this fence and then broke it. I said, well, actually, I wasn't climbing up on the fence. Some other kids were, but it came down and, and hit me in the back. And they said, well, um, we don't know whether that's the truth. Um, doesn't sound very credible. You're just making that up for yourself. Um, you're suspended for the rest of the semester. I said, what does that mean? There's like three days of classes left and then exams. And they said, um, you're, you, got, you have to leave the dorm. You have to leave the campus. You cannot take your exams. Um, you're done for the spring semester. And I went back to my dorm, and I thought about it for a bit. And I said, fuck them. <laughs> and I figured. I don't know if anybody's going to know I'm doing this. So I went to my classes. I took my exams. I got my grades. Nobody ever seemed to know it again. <laughs> then when I applied to law school, I realized it was going to be on my record that I'd been suspended. So I made an appointment to go see the dean of students. I think it was a different dean of students. I don't really remember for sure now. And I told them my version of it, which was accurate. And he had decided to expunge the... Um, the suspension. And, but for that, I probably would not have gotten into law school. So that was my first year of law school. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Is that the end of your time demonstrating? No, definitely not. Right. And uh, so let's talk a little about the First Amendment. Uh, and maybe just we can start with a really preliminary question, which is what is even the logic behind the robust protection of free speech? Why even do it? Well, there's a variety of different reasons why uh, free speech is thought to be important. Um, one is in a democracy, uh, it's important that individuals be able to participate in the electoral and governing process. And to be free to do that by hearing ideas and information and positions across the spectrum, to be able to make their own judgments about what policies and what individuals they want to support or to oppose, 
and that the best way for them to be able to do that is to be able to both express themselves openly and freely and to hear the views of others openly and freely. Another reason why um, freedom of speech is thought to be important um, has to do with um, individual self-fulfillment, that a part of humanity is thought to be the ability to express your own views about what you think, whether it's about politics or anything else, um, just in the sense that humanity is partly about being able to be an independent person who can not silence oneself, but can simply say what one thinks, because that in itself is part of what it is to be a free person, even apart from the political role. Um, and the third is that we make decisions all the time about our lives. Anything from who to vote for, to what car to buy, to whether to go to college, to what college to go to, to what courses to take, and on and on and on and on. And we should have the ability to make those decisions by being exposed to all of the information and all of the points of view that are out there. So we can make what we regard as the best decision for ourselves. So those are the three primary reasons why freedom of speech uh, is regarded as important, particularly in a democratic society, but in, even in a free society, whether or not it's democratic. Um, and uh, the framers of the Constitution um, we're thinking of it primarily, I would think, from a political standpoint at that time when they put the First Amendment of the Constitution, but they, they no doubt also were aware of the other rationales as well. So, I mean, if I think about those three, it sounds like at least two of them, maybe all three of them, are kind of instrumental in a certain way, that they really are. There's a goal that we want to uh, support, let's say, um, informed democratic decision making, making informed decisions for our own life about whether to get vaccinated or not, and that free speech becomes a helpful vehicle or a necessary, perhaps, vehicle for making these kinds of proper choices. I just wonder about the world we live in today. I mean, I think there's a lot of concern uh, among people, among young people as well, that um, maybe this robust protection of free speech <coughs> is not serving uh, these interests particularly well. Um, that uh, both we see um, things such as uh, hate speech on the one hand, and then also the circulation of disinformation on the other. So I wonder if you could talk a little about that, these kind of, uh, the way in which present realities might be challenging some of the assumptions that have historically undergirded the First Amendment uh, tradition. So those concerns have been there from the very beginning, and they have existed always throughout time. Um, there's nothing in that sense particularly unique about the current moment. Um, there was a time when uh, if you were in a college, for example, you could not uh, take positions that were inconsistent with the religious views of the leaders of the college. If you did, you would be expelled. Um, during the period of slavery, uh, in the North, you could not um, uh, endorse slavery if you were a student in a college. Uh, and if you were in the South, if you opposed slavery, in both of those situations, whether as a professor or as a student, you would be expelled or fired. There was no real commitment to freedom of speech because people were confident they knew what the truth was. Um, and during World War I, for example, thousands of individuals, uh, progressives and socialists, were arrested, prosecuted, uh, put in jail for 10 to 20 years, and even sent out of the country because they criticized the war and the draft, um, because people thought that was simply uh, the wrong, wrong, wrong thing to do. It was not only factually wrong, but it was dangerous to the country. It was harmful to the country. During the communist era, uh, students at universities across the country uh, and faculty members at universities across the country um, were not permitted to take positions that were seen as, as sympathetic to or supportive of, of communism. Um, if they'd been a member of a, a progressive organization 20 years earlier, they could be suspended or, or expelled because they might not be uh, loyal to the country and to the values of the country. So the, the notion, and during the Vietnam War, for the examples I gave myself, um, and the civil rights movement, um, there's always been in our history strong disagreements among people about what they firmly believe to be true and to be right. And the danger is to enable one group to silence the other doesn't mean the one that's doing the silencing is right. Um, in almost all the examples I just gave, history has taught that the ones doing the silencing were wrong, in fact. And another example is creationism, 
and evolution. Um, there was a long time when you could not advocate evolution um, without getting expelled or, or, or fired if you were at a university uh, or fired from a job if you were an employee. Um, so the, a, a key thing about the history of free speech is that these conflicts are constant. They're always there. The issues change. What's seen as right and wrong changes. Um, and, you know, the idea that there would be uh, equality for women was completely foreign to this country, except for the fact that people were allowed to have free speech arguing that equality for women was essential and right and moral and just. And we would never have had any kind of equality for people who were gay or lesbian or transsexual, but for the fact that people were not able to be silenced insofar as their views were regarded as erroneous and dangerous to society. And they eventually were able to carry the day. So I think that the, there's nothing about the current situation, as much as we might think it's unique, just as people in the, in the McCarthy era of communism thought it was unique or in the evolution and creationism period thought it was unique, or in the civil rights movement thought it was unique. It's not. This is just part of human nature, and that we will disagree on things always, and we will emphatically believe that we are right and somebody else is wrong. And part of the, 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 the reason for free speech is we don't have any good way of deciding who's right and who's wrong. We don't want to give to anybody the power of making that judgment. A, because they may be wrong, and B, because they may have bad motives. And it's better to let this go in the marketplace of ideas. It's not perfect. We will not always come to the right conclusions. But if you look back over time, we've made progress as a society. And we've made that progress largely because of the ability we've had to challenge the accepted wisdom. And on balance, we've done a better job than we might have done if some people in power were able to determine what you can say and what you can't say. That's, when I look at this, there's nothing unique about the current situation um, in, ter in terms of the basic predicate of free speech. Can I, and, uh, do you want to say something? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Can I, so there's a particular kind of case that I, I think I agree with everything you said, but I do find a bit dismaying, and I'm curious what you think about it. It has to do with what I see as a kind of tension between, current tension we have between scientific expertise and free speech. So we've had a number of cases, right? Right. I, we, we rightly defer to experts about whether the vaccines are effective, the best way measures to take against COVID, whether climate change is a real danger, whether our elections were fair and free. And of course, experts can get things wrong too. They're not infallible. So they need to listen to opposing opinions. But, and to determine their strength. But I'm not an expert. I'm not in a position to determine which arguments are better than which. And so given that that's sort of part of, it's sort of internal to the scientific enterprise that non-experts can't really weigh in, what real value is there in allowing non-experts to fill the public sphere with all kinds of dubious scientific claims, given how much danger that those claims have clearly had? So there are a couple of, this, this is a complicated question. Um, and it, it basically has to do with what you're presuming to be false speech. Right? You know, one problem, of course, is what we may think at a particular moment to be false speech, we may learn over time is not. It's actually correct, even though at any particular point in time we may believe it to be inaccurate and false. Um, but we also know there is false speech. And the Supreme Court has recognized that there are certain types of false speech that are called low-value speech for purposes of the First Amendment. And false speech is one of them, in theory. Therefore, for example, the government can regulate certain types of false speech in a way that it can't regulate other speech. So, for example, there are circumstances in which defamation can be regulated, certain conditions are satisfied, in which perjury in a court of law can be regulated, in which fraud to deceive someone into buying a product that you're selling to them by making false statements can be regulated. Um, but at the same time, the court has been very reluctant to allow a broad, open-ended notion that false speech can be punished, partly because they are uncomfortable with the idea of giving government the power to decide which speech is true and which speech is false. Government is not necessarily trustworthy. 
And they may have all sorts of self-interest and motivations that lead them to conclude certain things are false and certain things are true when in fact they're not. And to give them the definitive power to make those determinations is to exceed to the potential for real danger. The other reason why it's, con it's concerning is that in many circumstances, it's the government who would initiate the proceeding to prosecute someone for making false statements of this sort. And then the question is, well, governments have enormous discretion. There are endless false statements out there, right? They're, they're almost infinite. And the question is, who's the government going to prosecute for making their false statements? Are they going to do this in a completely new, neutral and fair-minded and balanced manner? Or are they going to go after their enemies? Are they going to go after their critics? And so part of this, too, is recognizing the risk of giving that kind of power to individuals who may well abuse the power. So even if they're only going to prosecute truly false statements, they may only prosecute truly false statements that damage them, not false statements that benefit them. Do we want to give the government that power? The court has been very reluctant to do that. That isn't to say that there isn't a cost to society of false statements. The question is how to strike the right balance between that cost and the cost of enabling the government to abuse the authority to decide what false statements to prosecute and to decide what's actually false and what's true. So, well, actually, let me just follow up with that. Sure. Um, because I certainly agree with you that um, I'd be very wary about handing the government the power <laughs> to make these kind of determinations. Uh, at the same time, it does strike me that, um, again, this might be my own, um, my own uh, deep ingrained pessimism. And I think it's actually helpful to hear the historical um, perspective that we've seen similar things in the past. But I, I guess I need some convincing about that because it does strike me that the the organization of social media right now creates a climate in which disinformation can circulate in ways that it's never been able to do before. And so I was wondering if there really is perhaps something, A, unique about this moment, and then B, if we're not comfortable with having government making these decisions, uh, are we more comfortable with having Facebook make these decisions about curating what is actually on their, their site? So, incidentally, um, Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia University, who's been a friend of mine for half a century, um, uh, he clerked at the Supreme Court with Chief Justice Warren Burger when I was clerking for uh, William Brennan. Uh, we've written a number of books together over the years. We're currently working on a book on social media um, and the future of democracy. And it, it, it raises exactly these very complicated questions. Um, we now face um, a method of communication that is extraordinarily pervasive and powerful. And the question is how much control um, private entities should be allowed to have to control that method of communication and how much we should trust the government to intervene and make decisions uh, about what is permitted and what is not permitted. And I think we're, we're at a moment now where there's a pretty broad consensus that social media presents a challenge that we need to take seriously, and we need to think hard about what is the best way to regulate this that, that does more good than harm. And we had a similar moment in history. Um, in the 1930s, when radio came into existence, and then later television, um, Congress was very concerned about the fact that there were only two or three, initially, radio frequencies in any given geographic area. So a city like Chicago or New York, uh, would have two or three radio frequencies. And if this was made part of the, the free market, then some rich person could simply buy both or all three frequencies and use them to put forth whatever political and ideological views that they wanted to communicate. And given the potential power of this new means of communication, the government saw this as an, a, a serious, grave danger to the success of democracy. And so what... Congress did was to pass the Radio Act, which then became the Federal Communications Act, which basically said this is a public good, and therefore no one can use these frequencies without a license from the Federal Communications Commission. That is, a government agency would now have the authority to decide who would have control over any of these frequencies. And then they had to renew their licenses every six or seven years and in order to meet the requirements, they had to be fair and balanced in their presentation, particularly of political 
uh, and ideological information, and they had to do it in a responsible and fair-minded manner. Um, and this actually worked reasonably well. Um, for those of us who grew up in the prior eras, um, most people who got their news and information um, got it from ABC, NBC, CBS, or various radio stations, um, and from mostly newspapers like the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Philadelphia Inquirer or whatever, um, that were basically responsible. And there were exceptions to that, not on radio and television in that era, but there were newspapers and magazines that were kind of off the charts, but very few people really had access to them. Um, and that led to uh, a, a kind of common understanding of issues. Now, despite that, we had a communist era, we had a civil rights era, era we had attitudes about gays and lesbians and so on, so I'm not suggesting for a moment it was perfect. But at least in terms of a general understanding of the nation, there was much more of a, of a universal sense of that. Um, with the advent of cable, um, the Reagan administration eliminated the fairness doctrine. Um, on cable, therefore, for the first time, you got things like Fox News and MSNBC, which didn't exist before, and a lot beyond that. Um, and then, of course, with the internet and social media, everything's all over the lot. And the, the danger we now face is that many people um, get their news and information from sources, particularly, say, Facebook and Twitter, um, that feed them polarizing information. What they are interested in more than anything is having users, so advertisers will pay them to get their advertisements to the people. And the way they do that is if you go online and you start looking at left-wing or right-wing material, and liking it, they will then send you more and more that you like, so you will spend more and more time on Facebook or on Twitter looking at the stuff you like. And that will create a serious problem of polarization, which we now see in our society, that is due at least in part to the impact of social media. In addition, there's the false news issue. One of the things that Congress did when uh, social media came into existence was to enact Section 230 of the Communications Act. And the reason for that was as follows. Ordinary media, radio stations, television stations, newspapers, magazines, if they publish or broadcast material that is defamatory, that's actionable, or that is obscene, or that is in any other way subject to legal limitation, even if they didn't write it, even if they just allowed someone to write a letter to the editor and they published it, right, or an advertisement that they allowed to publish and it had fraudulent information in it, they could be held liable for what they published. With social media, Congress decided that we want this to be an enormous public forum where each of us, without having someone screen everything we say, are able to say whatever we please. Because we don't do that, and the social media are held liable because you publish something that's defamatory or that's obscene or that's a threat, then they will want to screen every single thing that all of us put up there all the time so they don't get held liable. And that will destroy the whole aspiration of creating this extraordinary opportunity that all of us now have to be completely free to say whatever we want. Now, we can be held liable, just to make sure you understand that. If you publish a threat, or you publish defamation, or you publish something else that's fraudulent, you can be held liable, but Facebook and Twitter can't. And the idea was to basically avoid the, the, the responsibility on their part to have to screen everything that everybody would want to put up there. It would change completely the nature of social media. And so they had this vision of having this extraordinary free speech experience for all of us and without an intermediary being responsible for it. Um, and that has worked, in one sense, amazingly well. But it's also had downsides. Yeah. And it's had the downside that it, it enables people to put onto social media all sorts of material that is um, not legal. And it's very hard for people to prosecute the person who posts it because they're all over the world and it's hard to know who they are and, and they use phony uh, identities and so on. So rarely does someone who posts something that's a threat or fraudulent or whatever uh, actually get sued or prosecuted for it on social media. Um, and the, the Facebook and Twitter 
don't have any particular incentive legally to worry about it. So the question now is how to manage that. Is there a way to, to change that? And on the one hand, we don't want to destroy the positive value of social media. On the other hand, we can see now that the harm that's being created by, by this, this means of communication is far greater than anybody imagined uh, when Section 230 was enacted. So this, yeah. Right, yeah, to, if, to just follow up, I mean, one sure. thing I think is very interesting about what I've heard you say is I think uh, one of the themes that at least some of the students um, who are present here have heard during the semester is questions about whether technology is responsible for, whether there's a kind of almost technological determinism that, uh, that um, explains the engines of history. And it seems like you're right now pushing back against some notion that it's in the nature of the technology that's created the problem. It's really in the regulatory decisions that we've made. And I just wonder if the upshot of what you're saying is um, you in reintroduce the fairness doctrine, you repeal Section 230. Would that kind of regulatory response uh, address the kind of problems that we're encountering today? Like, why isn't that a sufficient response to the problems you're articulating? So if we eliminated Section 230, and... And is everyone following what uh, Professor Stone said about Section 230? What it yeah. means? Yeah. So if we eliminated it, and if Facebook and Twitter and so on were now getting sued or prosecuted for allowing illegal or legally actionable material to be posted up there, and they actually were being subject to serious penalties, it would, just, it would destroy what we now have come to see as social media. And Many of us use social media and enjoy it and like the ability to communicate with people all over the world. And that would be significantly or could be significantly inhibited. And the question is, was the world better before we had that? Um, it was better in one sense in that there was not the proliferation of false and misleading and hateful information that is so much more present in the world than it was before. On the other hand, you're not able to hear all sorts of positions and information and ideas that actually are good to hear because they challenge your own views and to make you make you think differently. Um, so I, I think I think the real question for the moment, and this is what this book is about, um, the way this, this, this is explain what it is, the way the book works is is Bollinger and I invite eighteen invited eighteen people to write essays addressing these kinds of questions, and these are people in the technological world. They're legal scholars, um, history, historians, um, political figures. Um, uh, and then we have a commission of seven people uh, who read all the essays and then write a set of recommendations that the seven of us can agree upon. Um, and the people involved in this are people like Amy Klobuchar and Hillary Clinton um, and um, uh, a whole bunch of journalists, um, Marty Barron, who was the editor of the Washington Post. Uh, so they're really distinguished and interesting people. And one of the things that's clear is this is hard. This is hard. And I, I think the reality is we, we, we as, a, as a commission, as a group, have come up with some relatively modest suggestions that would make things better. But we recognize that it's not going to address the whole thing. Because to address the whole thing means largely destroying it. And that's just a trade-off that is not clear we're ready to make at this point. Can, can I ask a question about, I think I was a little confused about what you said about the fairness doctrine, because earlier you were, you'd said, we don't want the government deciding which statements are true and which are false and which to prosecute and which not to. But I, if I'm not mistaken, the fairness doctrine, right, what counts as fair and balanced is itself going to be a judgment by the government. Why wouldn't we have exactly the same worries there that we had? Before. So there were lots of worries about whether creating the Federal Communications Commission would be politically neutral. Um, the members of the commission were appointed in a way that required both Republican and Democratic approval of the members and an equal number of people from each of the sides. And, uh, and, and, and for the most part, the people who served on the, on the Federal Communications did a reasonably good job. Uh, nonetheless, the Reagan admission, administration decided to get rid of it, partly because with the, with the creation of cable, they decided, well, now it's just, it's just not worth having anymore. Um, but uh, the truth is it did work reasonably well. And one of the things we talk about in this book and in the, in the commission is should we create the equivalent of a federal communications commission for social media um, that regulates what social media can do. And that's one of the recommendations that we have you know, different perspectives on. It, it's a lot more complicated to do this with social media 
uh, because it's so much larger and so, and so much so enormous relative to ABC, NBC, and CBS. Um, but that is one of the questions that's worth thinking about. Um, but the other thing is we're so polarized now in our politics that we have much less confidence today that one could actually appoint a group of individuals who would do this in a responsible, nonpartisan way than was true back in the 1930s and 1950s, um, when there were political divisions, but not nearly as extreme uh, and partisan as they are today. So all of these are open questions. And I think everybody who thinks about these seriously recognize they're serious questions. Another possibility is you break up Facebook and Twitter and turn them into much smaller entities. They don't have the power that they currently have. Um, and there's, there's a legitimate argument for that. And Amy Klobuchar, for example, argues that these should be regarded as antitrust questions. And that, that they now are, are so powerful and so dominant that one of the ways we can improve the situation is by having many more social media <laughs> networks that are available for people um, and that Facebook and Twitter don't have the, the power that they now do. But all of these are just up in the air at the moment. And, and they should be, because we don't really know enough yet to figure out what the right solution is. But that is a real problem, is absolutely true. Right. And yeah. none, none of the participants in this say, this is not a problem, go away. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could also maybe talk a little about the connections between free speech and maybe academic freedom as well. Um, one of the things that strikes me as uh, interesting, just as uh, being a professor today, is, and I wonder again, uh, I'd like to hear your insight from a historical perspective about this, is at least when I was a student, it tended to be the case that students were uh, pretty aggressive supporters of free speech. And uh, I think it's very interesting to observe that among students say, I think there's a lot of skepticism about free speech. Now, for me, that strikes me as somewhat unusual. I, again, I would like to hear your historical perspective, if that's, if that's true, if you think that there is something unusual about this particular moment, about the skepticism towards free speech among young people. And, um, and that maybe we can talk a little about why that is the case. I mean, we've already spoken about, about the circulation of disinformation, but I guess a lot of it also has to do with the circulation of hate speech as well. Um, so at different points in our history, students, and that's obviously a kind of weird generalization because there's students all over the country. Um, uh, I don't think until relatively recently students were predominantly pro-free speech or anti-free speech. It depended on the culture in which they were living and whether the views that they held uh, tended to be the views that were dominant or the ones that wanted to be challenged. So did, if you take the examples of um, uh, schools in the South and schools in the North in, in the, in the pre-Civil War era, um, I would rather suspect that on both sides um, they were opposed to free speech. That is, students in the South did not want to hear people criticizing slavery, and students in the North did not want to hear um, people defending slavery, like their institutions, um, and because they were part of the culture in which they were living at that time. Um, and uh, during World War I, um, I would guess most students at that time, but I'm not sure, I would guess most students at that time were, were more in favor of free speech, being able to criticize the war, but I'm not sure that's right. That might have been the much more narrow socialist um, part of the, of the student body, which was not so much the, the overall student body. So they may have been anti-free speech in that, in that context, context as well. Um, during the McCarthy era, again, I'm not sure. I think it varied from where you were. Um, there were some places that really believed communism was evil and therefore would have been opposed to uh, having people advocate communism. And there are other parts of the country where people had different views. So I, I don't think there's a, a, a necessary period. Beginning in the 1960s, students became pretty fervently in favor of free speech because of the civil rights movement and because of the, um, the anti-war movement and because of the gay rights movement and the women's rights movement. Um, those were all situations where the views being expressed were anti-majoritarian. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there was a, a pretty strong cultural view that it's important that people be able to challenge the accepted wisdom. And because the accepted wisdom that generation of students in general believed was wrong and that women should not be treated differently from men and blacks should not be treated differently than whites and gays should not be treated differently than gays and, and, and so on. And the Vietnam War should not be regarded as worth fighting. Um, and, and at least for that generation of students, I think that the vast majority of them were adamantly pro-free speech because it was in their self-interest to be in favor of free speech. Because if, if they were not in favor of free speech, uh, they would be suppressed 
because their views were the minority view being put forth. So I don't think, honestly, one can say that there is an age issue mm -hmm. as much as a kind of political issue depending upon uh, the moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, people from my generation are fervently in favor of free speech because what we have seen is that if we had not been allowed to express our views and people who agreed with us were not allowed to express our views, we would not have had as successful a civil rights movement, a successful women's rights movement, a successful anti-war movement, a successful gay rights movement, and so on. And those things happened only because uh, people were willing to allow people to express views that were clearly not majoritarian. And they eventually, largely, not entirely, of course, but largely carried the day. And that was just a classic example of why free speech is important. And so our generation, I think, therefore, is deeply committed to free speech because we see that it can work and that it can change the world in ways that we believe were positive. Uh, you know, other people, by the way, might say, you created a horrible world, mm -hmm. right? You have legalized <laughs> abortion, right? You have same-sex marriage. What the hell's wrong with this world now? It's completely screwed up because we allowed you guys to argue those things. So there's both sides. So I'm wondering about a kind of tension between what look like very salutary efforts, administrative efforts mainly, um, over the last few years, but especially ramped up over the last year to, um, you know, instill anti-racist attitudes and opinions in students and to do so by, you know, more or less coercive measures on faculty to change their syllabi, put more material on race and racism in their classes, change the way they teach. And that, you know, that sort of conflicts with the standard notion of academic freedom where professors are given autonomy to decide what to teach and how to teach it given the courses that they're teaching. But if these really are good things that we want our students to have anti-racist attitudes um, and opinions, shouldn't that, shouldn't we curtail academic freedom? And if not, does, do you think that colleges and universities just shouldn't be in the business of instilling anti-racist attitudes in their students? So it's important to separate two types of institutions. There is public government-run universities and there's private ones. Public government-run institutions are subject to the First Amendment, which applies to government. It does not apply to private institutions like Amherst or the University of Chicago. Um, in public institutions, they are governed by the First Amendment. And th they are therefore limited by that constitutional provision in terms of what they can and cannot do, in terms of dictating particular points of view that can be taught, or books that can be read or can't be read, and so on. Private institutions are not regulated, not restricted by the Constitution. It doesn't apply to private institutions. They are free to, to make their own decisions. Now, academic freedom is both protected by the First Amendment in public institutions, and it is something that private institutions have, over time, and really not till, not till the 20th century, have incorporated in, into part of their culture. And for the most part, they're similar now in terms of the, what the First Amendment requires and what most private institutions have themselves endorsed. So what's the point, first of all, of academic freedom, right? Well, it's, 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 it's two different things. In a, in a, in a public institution, it's, government should not be determining what people can learn. That's scary. That's dangerous. We don't want government having that power. In a private institution, it's a private institution. And, you know, just like a private newspaper can write whatever it wants, um, a, a public university or public college is free, a private, I'm sorry, university or college, is free to do whatever it wants in terms of its, its teaching. It can have religious views. It can have racist views. It's allowed to do that as a private ent entity. Um, but academic freedom says you shouldn't have those views. Academic freedom says the point of an academic institution, as we have generally defined it, is to seek the truth. It's to recognize that much of knowledge is questionable, that we have learned over time that what we thought was true was not true, that what we thought was right was not right. And we should not be allowed in the academy to dictate what is true and what is false and what is right and what is wrong. It should all be open always to challenge and to question and to argument. 
And through that, we both gain the intellectual skills of argument and reason and thinking and thinking for ourselves and being clear-minded and being persuasive, which is part a central part of what education is about. It's teaching you those intellectual and analytical skills, not so much facts and information. Um, but also for faculty and to teachers and scholars, it's to be able to seek out new insights and to challenge conventional wisdom. And to do that, you have to have the ability to pose often challenging and upsetting and disturbing positions that maybe turn out to be sensible or turn out to be wrong or moral or immoral. But the only way you can figure it out is by talking about it, arguing about it, reasoning about it, and so on. Now, to come back to your specific question, um, individual faculty members have on the one hand, and should have on the one hand, in serious academic institutions, the freedom to decide how they will teach what they teach. Now, that's not meant to be regarded as without boundaries, right? A professor of history can't decide in their history of America class to teach mathematics, right? They can't do that. That's not part of their academic freedom. It's not their job to do that, right? There are limits in what you can do, right? But they're meant to be those kinds of limits, not limits on what you can teach within the subject matter that you teach it and how you can present it. That's part of the professor's freedom. Now, that isn't to say that a college or university can't encourage, or a department can't encourage faculty members to address certain types of issues and to expose their students to certain challenges and certain problems. Um, because it is thought by the department that this is a positive way of addressing a scientific question or a historical question or the sociological question or a legal question. But it's never dictated. It's something you talk about and you discuss it with your colleagues and you try to come hopefully in good faith to the best way of doing this within your own judgment. And universities over the last half century at least, since they've come to accept academic freedom as a truly core element of what their mission is because of the belief that that's the best way to come to truth. It's the best way to learn. It's the best way to teach the best way to gain knowledge, then you can't dictate to them what they will teach or what they cannot teach. Now, again, there are these extreme exceptions, like the mathematics teacher who wants to teach history, the history teacher wants to teach mathematics. That's different. But um, apart from those sorts of extremes, the basic precept is you can write about what you want to write about. You can argue whatever positions you think are correct and that are worth pursuing as a scholar. And you can teach within your subject matter uh, the perspectives that you think are most sensible and are most um, enticing and interesting and challenging to the students. Um, so if, if I understand, so if you were to, let's say, make a Venn diagram of uh, free speech and then to make a Venn diagram of academic freedom in, let's say, private colleges and universities, uh, would you basically say they, they kind of overlap with one another? Yeah, I think private, I think, Good private universities and colleges um, have decided to adhere through their own organizations, both internally and with other colleges and universities, uh, uh, in various organizations like the, the American Philosophical Society and, and so on, um, have decided to embrace these principles as the basic principles of American higher education. And there are exceptions. There are uh, private colleges and universities that have religious um, definitions and who obviously teach certain religious views is what they regard as right. And there are institutions, private, not public, that choose to be very conservative, and others that choose to be very liberal. And they have the First Amendment right to do that. They're allowed to do that. But those who think about academic freedom and about true excellence in the academy, almost to a person, regard that as not the best way to educate and to think about questions. You should not have preconceived notions about what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong, what's, and so on. Um, but there were certainly private institutions that do that. They were allowed to do that. Nothing prevents them from doing that, um, unlike publics. Uh, and, uh, but, but if you look at, at what, what institutions in the United States are regarded as the best academic institutions among the private sphere, for example, 
under almost any measurement, other than those that are starting from a position of bias, what you'll find is they're all institutions that adhere to the fundamental principle of academic freedom, because that's where knowledge grows. Yeah, actually, let me just push back on that just a little bit. And maybe this is another way of rephrasing the question that Nisha was asking, because I could imagine how, uh, so I'm going to make an argument that maybe if you're going to draw that Venn, di Venn diagram, academic freedom should be smaller than First Amendment freedoms or free speech freedoms in general. And the reason being that uh, in political discourse, um, civility doesn't necessarily play a, a, a huge role. Uh, whereas when you have a community, uh, there should be norms of civility. And those norms of civility uh, kind of require that we constrict sort of the, the universe of things that are said. And um, what, what, do you, what do you make about that as, as an argument for um, kind of shrinking the domain? Well, the problem with that... civility, I, I mean like respect particularly of, let's say, um, historically disadvantaged, you know, historically underrepresented people, that kind of thing. Uh, well, civility, of course, does not mean that. Right, right. It you you just, yeah. just, for your own ideological reasons, yeah. you just change the definition of right. civility, yeah. um, <laughs> which is part of the problem. Um, so civility is something universities should encourage. And in the Chicago free speech principle, which I chair the committee that wrote that, we make very clear that, that promoting civility and mutual respect is an important value and aspiration of academic discourse and uh, culture in a, in a free and open society, in a free and open uh, academy. Um, on the other hand, if the institution starts disciplining what it terms incivility, mm -hmm. it immediately gets into the business of deciding which incivility is okay and which incivility is not okay. Mm -hmm. And that's something which, you know, many of us may believe we know what's, what should be punished and what should be allowed. But other people will have different views on that. Yeah. And should these institutions of academic freedom be making those judgments? To some degree, the answer is yes, frankly. In a classroom, for example, if a student or a faculty member uses clearly insulting, insulting, racist, sexist, um, anti-Semitic language directed towards a student, right? That would be regarded as completely off the charts and inappropriate, right? You'd still have to figure out which words are okay and which words are not okay, which is a mess. But there's a sense that that's a violation of the, of the commitment in the classroom of having a level of um, maturity and civility and so on. And the same would be true for students, directing those words at another in the classroom. Outside the classroom, though, it's more complicated because that's more like the real world. And uh, should universities be in the business of policing all of this? The best way to do it is by education. The best way to do it is by having a view about what it means to have a degree of civility and recognizing that we live in the best society when people do not needlessly insult and hurt one another, needlessly is the key word, insert, in, insult, or hate one another. And that's something universities should educate people about. Mm -hmm. um, and, but punishing them is more complicated because then you've got to actually pick and choose what word, what, in what context gets punished and what doesn't. Yeah. And the classroom is the one place, dorms, maybe it's complicated, uh, where it may be okay to do those things, but they're they're tricky and they're they're difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you want to follow up, I don't know if you do, but um, I want to turn it over to you people. So, um, if you have a question that you'd like to pose to Professor Stone, uh, you can kind of line up uh, behind that mic over there. And uh, if uh, and if you, you don't, I'll call on you. Yes, and and, and if you <laughs> are find, if you find yourself in an inaccessible spot, just raise your hand, and we can uh, hand you the mic. Um, so, uh, any questions so far? Or maybe we'll just ask. Do you already have one? For, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So let's just. Uh, Hello. Um, I guess. My question sort of falls under the lines of like the Twitter and like social media discussion. Like as all of us well know, uh, last January, uh, there was a whole instance of January 6th. Um, and then there was the whole thing of President, from then President Trump being uh, banned from Twitter, at least his personal account. Um, so there you have a private company um, removing the President of the United States um, because he was saying things like as his person, like these are official statements apparently, um, like for an official statement 
he made um, as president. Um, how, and, and a common criticism of that act was that, you know, yes, Trump violated um, the Twitter's services about civility, like advocating for violence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yet members of the Taliban have Twitter accounts and they tweet um, frequently. Um, and Twitter has not banned them. Um, so I guess my question isn't really a question, it's just a mess where you have a private company um, that's international in scale, so then really can the US government like do something about it when you have people who are not in the United States like using and interacting um, with this uh, with this application that is also being used by politicians as like an official sphere of like discussion and like conveying information. Sorry. But. No, that's a, a great question. Um, the Trump incident uh, indicates probably better than any other single moment the extraordinary power social media has. I mean, the ability to take the president off of Twitter because they disapprove of what he said. You know, I disapprove of it. Many of you may disapprove of it. But I don't have the power to silence people. And it's not even clear it was illegal. It was criminal. Um, and yet they have the power to do that to someone as central to the democracy as the sitting president of the United States. Um, and so that in itself illustrates how much we have given to these entities in terms of discretion. Um, and that's, no, I mean, I, I, I'm not a Trump supporter in the slightest, um, but I think that that was a really complicated, problematic thing to do. Um, and so there, that just illustrates the power that, that private social media now has in our society. Um, they could take Joe Biden down if they want to. And um, any of you, they could take down if they want to. Nothing prevents them from doing it. There's no legal limitation in this regard on their authority. And there's a sense in which one might say, that's kind of crazy, right? There should be constraints. Um, the other question is the foreign issue, um, which is another one of the questions that this set of essays in the book I've mentioned is, is trying to make sense of, is you know, how do you decide uh, to what extent foreign countries and foreign organizations and speakers uh, should have access to our communication means, particularly when they're doing it in ways that are designed to, for example, to influence public opinion by falsehood uh, and to influence politics by, by disc not disclosing who they are by lying about who they are, right? So they tell you they're you know, the people living in Omaha when in fact they're in the Soviet Union. Um, it's not the Soviet Union anymore. They're in Russia. Uh, that shows my age, yeah. <laughs> um, did that, when did that happen? <laughs> While we were talking. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so these are, these are again major problems. Um, and it was never possible before for any um, publishing communicative entity to make a decision like taking the president of the United States off Twitter uh, in American history. There was nothing that had that power before. And this is a real danger to us. And, and again, the problem is how, how to solve this, how to fix it. And you, know, it'll be a, you should take a course on how to, how to do this, right? It's, it's really hard. And as much as you think as there are easy solutions, as you begin playing them out, you realize, no, that's a nightmare. Right. So, uh, but that's a, that's another great example of what we face going forward, um, and we do have to figure out how to address it. There's no question in my mind that we cannot allow a couple of extraordinarily large entities to have this degree of power over our democracy, over our ability to know and to gain information. They will feed you what their algorithms tell them they should feed you. You have no control over it. And it could be false, it could be misleading, it could be reinforcing what you already believe in. Um, and you have no direct control over it at all. And that's, that's a real problem for the future of democracy unless somebody figures out how to address that. Mm -hmm. Next question. Yeah. Yeah, if you have a question, it's probably a good idea right now to get up, kind of line and, up. Yeah. and line up so that we can save some time and stuff. So do. Uh, line up behind the the mic. We can. 
Uh, so this is kind of going on with the theme of social media. Um, well, perhaps not social media, but digital communication. Uh, What's the difference? Just, so, well, well, what is the difference? Well, you have social media, which is especially, you know, interpersonal communication. The internet in general is where you can put information that may or may not be interacting. You know, there are different, different modes of interaction. Um, cutting off that tangent, though. So I was wondering about situations in which um, there may be an obligation to speak. Um, and, the, and, you know... For example, I like maybe in in um, you know news outlets when an article uh, is like when, when the text of an article is edited, or maybe you know even an instance of like the, the, that they're um, charged with like some, some kind of some kind of de defamation, um, and the, so, and the, so changes are made to the original text. Uh, sometimes they're like unless you have previous knowledge of what has occurred. Um, unless you personally strive to, you know, call that call, call that change out, uh, hey, these articles, these, these articles that, that come from these sources of information can be edited without the user's knowledge. Um, there's no like, there's there's no um, obligation, I guess, to keep a track record of the kind uh, of what kinds of edits are made for what purpose um, to kind of you know help with the understanding of the context of the of of the information that they are being given. So who's editing? <laughs> this, right. So I read an article for, on the on the Atlantic on um censor, like censorship and inform and the and the interchange of inform of information on the web, and there is very little in the way of you know preserving internet history, digital history, the history of the information that 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 we that we share um in these mediums, and so a lot of these mediums are private. Um, so there's no, there there is no like obligation to you know maintain like a track record of the things that are that that are made things that are, that change um, even if they concern you know national news or things that 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 you know pertain to to uh, you know our own lives and livelihoods like what what would you think about that when like this when um, it's not an issue of censorship but you know these are gonna the, these entities should be you know doing their best to like inform us the public as experts on these situations and they don't by these entities you mean uh, like news outlets like like the the new york or the guardian perhaps like perhaps um that are not that are not um public but they're but they, but they they have they have a status as you know news outlets and therefore you know like they're they're perhaps they could be categorized as as this different um source of of information that could Do you get the question? I'm not yes. sure if I entirely okay. get the question. I okay. One way, yeah. I, I don't know if this is uh, what the what's being asked. I mean, maybe there's a, a idea that um, that there's actually not a stable text anymore. That in some of these, you know, these things are constantly being revised, and uh, and something that is uh, perhaps circulated that could be incendiary, and then when you try to find it, it's it's sort of gone. I mean, I don't know if that's... I mean, I remember when I was doing this book on the election, um, Chris Kobach uh, published something uh, in uh, Breitbart uh, claiming that uh, New Hampshire election was, uh, was riddled with fraud. And... Um, and he basically made some kind of retractive statement, but that was never published anywhere. And you try to then find his original arg uh, article, which widely circulated at the time, and it just kind of disappears. Right? That is, in essence, my question. Yes, yeah. Yeah. like because text is very is very different categorically yeah. to to the web, right. um, because like text is physical. You you have archives. Right. right. So let's, yeah. preservation. That anything that. So. Um, I mean, I, I, I gather the problem is people can put something up and then have it have an impact and then make it disappear. Mm -hmm. So after the fact, you can't sh show it. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I suppose that, this, I guess I have two off the top of my head reactions to this. One is there may be lots of good reasons why you want to be able to take something down because you published it and mm -hmm. then you realize later you were wrong, right? And so if you can r remove something, there may be very good reasons for wanting to do that because you realize you made a mistake. Um, and the other point, though, is you put something up and then you want to take it down because you, you want it to mislead people and then you want not to be caught for having done so. Um, so uh, the question is, should there be a mechanism that prevents people from removing things um, that, that, 
that Facebook or Twitter or whatever has that always keeps it in its own um, body of information, whether or not it's available any longer to the public. And I'd be surprised that they don't actually have that, frankly. I mean, maybe they don't, but I'd be actually surprised that they don't have that technologically. Um, but uh, I mean, I see the problem. If, if, if someone wants to defraud others in, 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 a, in a way and not get caught at it, you put it up and then as soon as it's, you accomplish your goal, you make it go away and nobody can necessarily prove that you ever really want to put it up. That, that is a problem. And I would think that if, if, one, if one sees it as enough of a problem, I don't know whether it is or not, um, the, you could preserve it. On the other hand, people have a strong interest in, in privacy and not wanting to be held accountable for things they said when they changed their mind. So one of the reasons, legitimate reasons, you might want to take things down is because you realized you didn't say the right thing. And so having an absolute rule that everything that you put up is somewhere there in the past uh, it strikes me as some, there's good things about it and bad things about it. Right. That's, um, um, so actually, let's move to the next question, yes. please. Yeah. Thank Sorry. you very much. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a question about Citizens United and um, the role of money as a form of speech more broadly. Um, in your essay that you sent to all of us, you say that the Supreme Court has come to um, understand that the equality of status in the field of ideas, um, that there should be equality of status in the field of ideas and that the government must therefore afford all um, points of view and equal opportunity to be heard. Um, and then... If someone or some group has more money than myself, then um, they have more of an opportunity to influence political debate. Uh, and then it, at the end of your essay, you say that um, Chief Justice John Roberts cites uh, the Citizens United decision as one of his um, like his legacy of defending free speech. But um, given that it allows other, like out interest groups to have more power than individuals depending on the amount of money that they have. Wouldn't banning super PACs um, strengthen the First Amendment by giving individuals a greater proportion um, of say in terms of political debate? Uh, yes, I think Citizens United was a terrible decision. Um, even though it was pro-free speech, it expanded free speech. That's what Roberts was saying. The, my, my view would have been retract, restricting free speech more. Because um, my point is not that free speech is always good. But um, so the, the issue is, as you sort of described it, it, it's a critical one in American politics today, frankly. And, you know, one way to think about it is suppose there was a presidential debate and there were five candidates up there. And the moderator said, OK, we will give time to each of the candidates based upon how much you're willing to pay for it. Everyone would say, that's nuts. That's no way to have a, a debate about substantive issues, right? That's crazy, right? That's what these justices have created in our political arena. And in Citizens United, they overruled a decision from only seven years earlier, which had reached the opposite result. Now, I don't want to get too much into the weeds of, of doctrine, but the, best, the basic point about this is this. What I, what I had said in the piece I gave you is that viewpoint-based discrimination is, it the, is the centerpiece of what's inconsistent with the First Amendment. Campaign finance regulation is not viewpoint regulation. It does not say that Democrats can spend this much and Republicans can spend that much and socialists can send, spend this much. That would be viewpoint discrimination, right? This is a neutral law that applies to everyone regardless of what positions they're taking. And the more liberal justices on this issue have taken the view that this is a content neutral restriction of speech and it therefore should be permissible if it serves a sufficiently substantial government interest. And that because of the completely distorting effect that huge disparities in money can have in the political process and that that shouldn't be how we decide issues politically based upon money, that there's a sufficient justification to justify this even though it's limiting the ability of people to express themselves as much as they would like. If I'm a billionaire and I, I want to spend $50 million to support the election of my favorite candidate, and you tell me I can't do that, I can only spend $10,000, i am going to say, that's crazy. You can't do that. I want to spend more. Um, so that's the argument that they're making. Um, but the flip side of it is that's not a viewpoint-based rule. It's a content-based rule. It's saying that none of us are allowed to spend more than $10,000 
uh, or whatever number it is, and that that's neutral across individuals, and it's neutral across particular po political ideologies, um, and therefore it should be permissible as long as there's a substantial justification, and the substantial justification is the electoral process being a, a fair and sensible process, like a political debate would be a fair and, and sensible process. So I think that, yes, Roberts is very proud of that. He thinks it's pro-free speech. It is technically pro-free speech, but it's anti-democracy. Thank you. <clears throat> it seems that you attribute much of the success of various protest movements in the 20th century to free speech. And I, I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful. I'm, I'm just curious what you think. It doesn't seem to me, well, I, when I think back to these movements, I think of you know police violence, state and private violence against the people um, you know, protesting segregation against the people protesting for the right to vote, um, things like the Stonewall riots. That doesn't seem to me like, like you know, what you'd think of when you think of free speech, when you think of a triumph of free speech. You know, it's not like we had a black activist up on the stage, a moderator, and then a, and then a racist, and they said, you know, let's talk about segregation and figure it out. So I'm, I'm wondering, is free speech really, uh, really, should it really get the credit for these sorts of successes that we've seen? So the images that you have about these questions are real, right? Like Stonewall and like Selma and so on. Um, but the, what happened in those circumstances is the courts held that the government could not do what, could not constitutionally do what it was doing. And for example, in the civil rights cases, the Supreme Court held that the argument of the southern towns, cities, was that we have to prevent these civil rights marches because these white opponents are going to engage in violence. And the only way we can prevent the white opponents from engaging in violence is by stopping the marches and preventing the violence from occurring by that. What the Supreme Court held is you can't do that. You have to, in fact, protect the speakers and protect the marchers. And the practical reality is that after the court decided those things, that is what happened. And so what we see in our mind are the images from those moments when there was that violence. But once the courts said you can't do that, that meant that the violence could not be used to stop the speakers. And the speeches and the marches were allowed to then go on. Um, so after Stonewall, for example, you know, only a few days after it, there was a huge march in the city of New York that was protected by the police and there was, it, was, it was permitted. So um, I, I think one has to understand that if the, if, if the court had, said, had taken the opposite approach and said, you can prohibit speeches and marches as long as there is a threat of violence against the marches, then that would create what's called the heckler's veto, that individuals who don't want someone to be allowed to speak will simply make threats, even anonymous threats, that if they're allowed to speak, we're going to shoot them. Right? And then the, the police who don't want the marchers anyway because they don't agree with them would come in and say, you can't have a march, period, done. Right? So the reality is that one of the nice things about the violence is that it got a lot of pub publicity, ironically. I mean, in that sense, it got, it got visibility for the marchers, even though they were shut down. Um, but it also meant that thousands of other events took place because the government was not allowed to shut down the, the marchers. And that had a huge impact. Um, my question revolves around a hot issue right now in the state of Florida. Um, I believe two weeks ago, the administration at the University of Florida banned three professors from testifying on a voting on a controversial loading, a voting law case. And um, and the reason they stated for this ban was because it ran contrary to the, to the interests of the state of Florida because it challenged uh, the administration of Governor Ron DeSantis. So I know we were having conversations between the role of public universities and how they have to respect the First Amendment in comparison to private universities. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on the administration's decision to ban uh, professors from testifying on a uh, voting law case. So that was patently unconstitutional. And I think I read that they actually now changed it and allowed them to do it. Um, but but th that was just patently unconstitutional. And you know, to say that there are constitutional rights doesn't mean that government entities don't try to violate those rights. Um, and you know, then there may have to be litigation and, and so on. But that, there's absolutely no question that that was unconstitutional. Yeah. Those, those individuals had a right to testify on either side of the question. Doesn't matter which side they wanted to testify. 
Hi. Uh, so, so far you've talked a lot about the ways in which larger institutions have effects on free speech. So like the government, social media companies, uh, college administrations. But I'm curious what you think about the ways in which public opinion can have an impact on free speech. And the example I'm thinking of here is cancel culture, which is a very like very loaded term. Um, but a lot of people would argue that that is an instance where while it takes place on Twitter, tw the Twitter, the company really has nothing to do with um, people feeling like they're being like forced out of public arena arenas or not allowed to express a certain opinion. Uh, and I'm curious how much legitimacy you would lend to the claim that public opinion and social sigma has some real effect on free speech. Um, good, great question. It obviously has a huge impact in many circumstances on the willingness of people to take positions that they believe to be correct because they are reluctant to pay the price of doing so. And this is like the heckler's veto, but it's not with violence necessarily, but it's with um, being treated as if you are a stupid, horrible, immoral person. And this, is, this goes to the point that I talked about, about chilling effect that most of the time, whether any of us say something that we believe to be true, is rarely likely to have a significant difference or impact on the world. And therefore, we can be deterred from saying something that can get us in trouble, either by being punished in some way, or just by being disapproved of and criticized and excoriated by others. Is it really worth it? Right? I want my life to go on without having everything be messy and ugly. And the, the, the reality is that people will, in fact, surrender their freedom to express their own points of view in most situations, not all necessarily, but in most situations, um, if they are going to pay some sort of a price for doing so. Um, and that is a real danger to the whole concept of free speech. And the how one deals with that is very difficult. In the civil rights cases, for example, um, the, the way of silencing it was by the police, and, and not, not by the police, by, other, by white citizens going there and throwing rocks and threatening people and firing them for participating in the demonstrations and so on. Um, and that's, that's not necessarily all that different from, in the current world, people being demonized for having taken positions that others don't like. I mean, some people are sufficiently courageous and convinced their views are right and are convinced that it's important for them to take those positions, that they're willing to take them even in the face of significant penalty, social penalties and other penalties. But most of us aren't willing to do that. And the consequence of that is to silence people from saying the things that they think are important to be heard. And in a free and open society, that's not a good state of affairs. That's, that's exactly what's going on in the civil rights marches. It's not violence, but it's inflicting upon people a penalty for expressing their point of view. Now, you can disagree with them. That's fine. But going beyond that is something one should think about. Because when you go beyond that, you're doing the same thing that the white Southerners were doing in the South. And you're basically trying to get people not to, not to say what they have a right to say because you want to shut them the hell up. And that's not the way we should operate as an, as an academy or as a democracy. You can respond to them. You can argue the other side. That's great. That's perfectly fine. But to try to actually silence them by penalizing them, whether it's by violence or otherwise, is not the way a mature citizen in a well-functioning society or democracy behaves. Do you think there's any remedy to that, considering that it's the collection, collective action of individuals and not something that's controlled by an institution? Um, it's very difficult to, um, to enforce other than by education. I mean, I think the best way to deal with that is by educating people that that's not the right thing to do. That's not respectful of the values of the academy, of the values of a democracy. And you may not disagree with, you may not agree with somebody, you might find their views abhorrent, but the right response is to explain why you think they're wrong 
and take the other position. It's not to do those things that you know are being designed to silence other people. Thank you. Can I just follow up on Elise's question? Because um, so John Stuart Mill, he actually thought that social coercion was in a way worse than legal sanctions. And the way he put it was he said that social coercion, unlike right, legal sanctions might stop you from acting in certain ways, but he said that social coercion enslaved the soul. And I take it what he meant by that was that when all the people around you disapprove of what you're saying or doing, you're not just going to stop saying or doing it. You're going to change your mind. You're going to stop thinking those thoughts because of the need for social con conformity, which you might not do with respect to just mere legal sanctions. Well, I don't have any problem with people, if there are 20 people disagreeing with one. I don't have any problem with that. And you're right. That might lead somebody to not to change their mind, which is fine, but to not change their mind, but just to shut up. And therefore, I think it's important for the people who disagree to be respectful. And even if you disagree with what somebody's views are, to not try to silence them by intimidation. And that's hard to do sometimes, because sometimes you feel passionately. But the problem is, we all feel passionately about different issues. And again, historically, that's not been a good way to work things out. That's not been a good way. It's a power trip. It's not, it's not debate. It's not discussion. It's not intellectual. Um, it's, it's power. And power is not the right way to, to figure out what the truth is and to persuade people. Persuading them is completely great, but intimidating is not. Uh, hi, Professor. I was wondering what your views are on, on the right to be forgotten and how that could potentially violate free speech and the freedom of press. Um, so the right to be forgotten basically suggests that um, if there are things that are said about you yes. that um, you find um, problematic or painful or, or invasion of privacy or whatever, or defamatory, um, should you have a right to make them go away, right? Or should the government give you a right to make them go away? Um, to the extent they are false and prove to be false, I think the answer is, in theory, yes, but that immediately gives you the question of what's false? You know, there's lots of things that may be said about you that if you could make them not be said anymore by claiming they're false, you'll claim they're false, even if they're true. Right? Did I get suspended from college? Are you kidding? I don't know where people got that idea. That's ridiculous. <laughs> right? That's completely false. Prove it. Nobody knows it. it was, I know you can't prove it because it was all expunged. Right? So um, you know, who's going to decide these questions? That's the first question. On the privacy side, which is what some of the European nations have done, is to say there are certain uh, facts about your life that you, are, you should have a right to privacy simple example would be nude pictures of you that somebody else takes, for example, when you're you know, in, a, in a locker room and they put it online and um, you want it taken down. And the question is, is there any reason why you should not be allowed to take it down? Well, in that case, there's not necessarily any issue of falsehood involved, um, although it may be that you posed for the photograph and that you actually knew what was going to happen, but then you got all hassled, hassled by it, so you said take it down and you're not being truthful about it. But that's not the normal situation there. I do think there is a, a interest in individual privacy. Um, and the American Supreme Court has, has agonized over this right, claimed right to privacy. Um, all of us can agree that there are circumstances in which it is wrong to publish and disclose information about individuals that was either disclosed in clearly private circumstances or which the person didn't even mean to disclose, as in the photograph in the shower example, um, or the, you know, the, having sex with somebody who, unbeknownst to you, is filming it, um, and then they put it on, on social media. Um, and the, the problem there, again, is simply one of who gets to decide whether this is sufficiently private, who gets to decide whether you knew it was happening, didn't know it was happening. Um, and, uh, and the right to be forgotten goes beyond the photograph. It, it, it goes to all sorts of things you've actually done in fact, and now don't want to be held responsible for it. Um, so, you know, you cheated on an exam 15 years ago, and you don't want anybody to know that. Do you have a right to have that taken down? Um, so I, I do think there are things about us that should not be out there and available to everybody because it, it will do us more harm than it will do anybody any good. But the problem, as always, is figuring out which things get taken down, who makes the decision, how do you litigate that, how do you decide it, um, but for Facebook, for example, to decide we're going to take things down, if you give us a credible argument, 
that this was inappropriate rather than having the government do it. I have no problem with that. All right, thank you. And we have time for one last question. Make it good, man. <laughs> do my best, Professor. Um, are there any thinkers on free speech with whom you vehemently disagree, but whose work has helped you clarify your own thoughts on, on free speech? Um, that's an interesting question. Are there any with whom I vehemently disagree, but their views have helped me to clarify my own views? That's a really interesting question. Um, hmm. I'm sure the answer is yes, but I, I, I'm not thinking of it offhand. Um, I mean, one argument would be, say, the originalist argument about the First Amendment, that uh, if you were uh, taking a strict originalist view about free speech, um, you would say that the Supreme Court's very famous decision in New York Times versus Sullivan is wrong. In New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, the court held that a government official suing the New York Times for defamation, for publishing a false statement about the public official in the performance of his duties, could not be the subject of liability unless the plaintiff, the public official, could prove that A, the statement was in fact false, and B, that the, the speaker, in this case the New York Times, published it with either knowledge of falsehood or with reckless disregard for the truth. Now, an originalist would say that at the time the Constitution was adopted, libel law, defamation law, was universally understood in the United States as saying, if I think you defamed me, whether I'm a public official or any Tom, Dick, and Harry, I can sue you if I can show that the statement you made harms my reputation. And you're liable to me unless you can prove the statement was true, period, right? Which puts an enormous burden or much larger burden on the speaker. But the Supreme Court said in New York Times and Sullivan was that that creates a serious chilling effect on the willingness of individuals to criticize public officials. Because if you are inadvertently wrong in what you have said, you can be held liable for defamation. And that seriously undermines the free and open discourse that we need in a free, in a free society. And therefore, the court completely overturned the originalist understanding of the First Amendment, which the framers presumably held. So that discourse, which I've had with several justices on the Supreme Court, actually, including Clarence Thomas, who believes New York Times and Sullivan should be overruled, um, forces you to think harder about, you know, what are the appropriate bounds of originalism? Um, to what extent should that limit our understanding of any constitutional provision? And what are the legitimate justifications for departing from that originalist understanding? And I think there are very good reasons for being willing to do that, um, because I would argue the framers of these provisions understood that we learn over time, and that their understanding of free speech was not what they meant to lock into the First Amendment, or their understanding of equal protection of the laws was not what they meant to lock into, that these were aspirations that they meant to put into the Constitution, and that it is appropriate for courts over time to learn from our experience and from our new understandings of reality and of society. Um, but that's an example of where conversations, in my case, with Anthony Scalia, who is a colleague of mine in Chicago, um, helped me to sort of articulate better my, my views about these issues. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out this afternoon. Thank you very much.